We're going to do a little bit of rational science, but before we do rational science, we need to find out what irrational science is. What is the irrational scientific method? And yeah, we have the irrational scientific method that was inherited from the 17th century. Supposedly, there was a revolution called uh, or known as the scientific revolution of the 17th century. What they did, they say they overturned the Greeks. For all these years, approximately 2,000 years, they were doing Greek science. And Greek science was, you know, a lot of it was hocus pocus. They uh, did not do experiments to test their hypothesis as it's known in it today. And so that's what changed in the 17th century. They say, let's do experiments to prove, to test, you know, uh, what actually happens. And so the big uh, test was the one that convinced everyone uh, was Galileo's test, apparently, uh, that he apparently dropped two balls, one uh, heavier than the other, apparently from the Tower of Pisa in Italy. And uh, they, one, the heavier one did not fall faster than the lighter one, as Aristotle suggested. Uh, in fact, they both fell at the same time. Well, the first thing uh, you should know is that um, uh, Stebbins, uh, Hollander, he did it way before uh, um, Galileo, and even before him, there were a couple of Italians among them, Galileo's teacher, who already had done that test. So they already knew what Galileo put in print. The only reason we credit Galileo today is because Newton mentioned Galileo. That's the only reason. Okay, so everybody thought the thing started with Galileo, and it's not even sure. In fact, it's very doubtful that he carried out uh, the two balls from the Tower of Pisa experiment. I don't think it ever happened. And the reason for that, uh, that I don't think it happened, is uh, Galileo started doing his weight, his mass experiments in about 1604, at the beginning of the century. He was put in uh, under house arrest uh, after his trial which was, I think, 1638, thereabouts. And there he picked up again. He went back to doing uh, weights and masses. He, he wrote his book right after, while he was in, in, under house arrest. And what he did at that point was he rolled, apparently he rolled balls down inclined planes, and that's how he determined that one goes at the same speed as another. He, he checked the speeds and all this kind of thing with some of the clocks he and antiquity, you know, some of the clocks he had, uh, water clocks maybe, that he had in those days. But he never went to the Tower of Pisa, partly because he was under house arrest. So I don't think he ever threw any balls from Tower of Pisa, unless he did it in 1600, for which there is no record of that at all. Okay, so what's the issue? Well, uh, be no, before we can talk about the scientific method, it'd be nice if we define it. And so let's look up the scientific method, see what it is, okay? And here's one version of it, and this comes from the American Heritage Dictionary. It says, scientific method, the principles and empirical processes. Empirical? That sounds like technology, not like science. Empirical, we don't empiricize anything in science. Science, we have to explain something, okay? You can do all the experiments you want. That doesn't mean you understood what you did. And so he says, empirical processes of discovery and demonstration necessary for scientific investigation. Well, hold it. Um, is science demonstration or is science investigation? Is science the detective who's in his dark basement doing experiments to try to learn something? You know, discover something maybe? Or is it demonstration, the prosecutor who goes in front of the jury and explains what he understands, what he knows, explains a mechanism, a cause? Which one's the scientist? So demonstration and investigation don't go well together because one refers to the detective and the other one to the prosecutor. These are two different uh, disciplines, you could say. So we got to choose which one is the scientific method. And what they did, they put, you know, they, they covered all the bases. They said it's all of it. <laughs> yeah, no kidding. That way you get, you know you have nothing to attack because if you attack one, they say no, but it's demonstration. And you say oh demonstration, no, it's investigation, and you can never win. Okay. Yeah, when you cover all the bases, it's very hard to play ball. Okay. okay, generally involving what? The observation of phenomena. So you observe, you gawk, you didn't understand squat, but you're a scientist because you observed. Okay, so you observe birds all day long, you didn't understand squat, what they're doing, but you say, hey, I did my eight hours, I punched my card, you know, um, I understood nothing, but hey, I gawked I, all day long, I drooled. So that's science drooling? The formulation of a, what, hypothesis concerning the phenomena. Well, what's wrong with this? The, the problem is that they never figured out what a hypothesis is. Okay, and when you look up hypothesis on the internet, you find all these different versions of what a hypothesis is. Here it is. 
One says that objective, state the purpose or hypothesis upon which the project is based, the purpose. Another one says a hypothesis is your question. Another one says it's a single tentative guess. Uh -huh. It's a hunch. Another one says it's an assumption. Another one says it's an explanation with some evidence and testing behind it. Uh, another one says it's a theory, but it's the provisional one. And again, says tentative theory. And yet another one says it's just data analysis. That's what a hypothesis is. So we have all these versions of hypothesis. And of course, if we have so many versions, we don't, again, they're covering all the bases. We're saying a hypothesis is all of the above. It's a prediction. It's an explanation. It's an assumption. It's everything. So we've got a problem because they never define the word hypothesis in a scientific way. Okay, that's the problem. So to say formulation of a hypothesis, we don't know what they're talking about. Maybe they formulated a prediction. Maybe they did an observation. Maybe that's what they're, they say, go observe. Okay, I observe. What does that mean? You know, so we don't know what a hypothesis is. Okay, you know, until they uh, zero in on that key word, we don't know what the scientific method is about. But uh, then they continue, experimentation uh, to demonstrate the truth or falseness of the hypothesis. Truth, falseness, that's an opinion. What is true to you is a lie to your neighbor. So, yeah, that is religion. So to say that experimentation, to do an experiment to prove falsity or truthfulness, you're talking about religion, not about science. And so if that's part of the scientific method of the 17th century, obviously, you know, it's bunk. It's irrational. And finally, it says, in a conclusion that validates or modifies the hypothesis. Validates, you mean approve of it. Uh, you're the peer and you say, I, I like your, that's an opinion also. You know, so validate has nothing to do with science. Validate just means religion, means that your peer approved and gave you a medal for what you did. But there's another peer over there or unpeer, and he disagrees with you. What about him? You know, so uh, validate means nothing. You know, validate is just an opinion, especially with some of the modern uh, experiments where, where there is no chance to validate. What you have is, you know, now they're accelerating so-called particles at the CERN and some of these other places. And they also do some tests uh, like NASA sends uh, probes into outer space. Can you validate that by running your own rocket from the, your backyard and validate what they did? No, you have to take their word for it because there is no validation. And if you have all these peers who were cut with the same mold, you know, I mean, they were all educated in the same way. And the guy at CERN says, oh, I confirm what they did at Slack and Slack confirmed what they did at Fermilab and Fermilab. And who knows what, the European whatever, you know, uh, uh, accelerators. Well, if, if all these people validate each other because they all believe in the same thing, they were all educated in the same way, then what kind of validation is that? I mean, hopefully you get someone who's outside that group and he validates. And the question is, again, can you run your own accelerator in your own backyard, you know, to verify what these people are doing? No, obviously not. So whatever they conclude has no validation whatsoever. Okay, here we have the Collins Dictionary. It also has a version of the scientific method. Let's find out what that's all about. Scientific method, a method of research. Again, is, is that what uh, scientific method is? It's research or demonstration? Well, research sounds like R&D. It looks like technology. What's technology? Well, there you have it. Uh, designing uh, or developing gadgets by trial and error. That's, that's what uh, R&D is. So if you're going to do research and development, you're not doing science. You're doing technology okay it says in which a problem is identified okay you identify the problem uh relevant data is gathered okay so you collect data is that science a hypothesis is formulated okay from these data again we don't know what a hypothesis is and a hypothesis is empirically tested and so you test it and what does that give us well that gives us an opinion because one guy tested and says well i agree with this that's what happened does that mean that he knows how it happened what caused it to happen what the mechanism is no, it's just description. Just a, it happened. And we measured, and this is the equation. That's it. That's called science. This is the problem. The problem is none of this is science because what they're doing essentially is, you know, saying that, um, uh, you know, that um, what they're just going to do is uh, observe, measure, get an equation, publish, and do it all again. And the other guy does the same thing. Some experiments they can verify, some they can't. When they do verify, who verifies it? Well, you know, another guy who thinks the same way. And the guy who verified the opposite and said, well, I didn't verify what you said. Well, they either dismiss him if he's minority and they overrule him, they over, uh, overvote him. You have people like Halton Arp, okay, who was an astronomer who was overruled 
He didn't agree with uh, what they were seeing out there in the sky. He had a different opinion, so they got rid of him. That's it. They said, well, you, you're not part of our group of peers, and we're going to kick you out. So that's how they solved it. So we do have people who have different uh, versions, different explanations, and if they're a minority, they're just kicked out. And so is that science or is that just politics? Okay, so this is a problem, serious problem. Okay, here we have a synthesis of what uh, what I call the mathematical method, which is the 17th century revolution, what they created. You observe, okay, so you gawk, yeah, drool, okay. You explain tentatively, apparently that's what a hypothesis is in, in mathematical physics. You make a prediction. You say, ah, I'm going to predict what's going to happen because I understand very well what's going to happen. And again, you know, we can, we can always uh, fool anyone who does a prediction uh, and show them that he never predicted anything. He can predict that there's going to be an eclipse tomorrow and it turns out that an asteroid destroys the Earth or the Moon and the eclipse never happened. And you can predict that your horse is going to win because the other ones are very, very slow. And I bet on the slowest horse in the group. And just before your horse is about to reach the finish line, I shoot him down and shoot all the other horses and let mine win. He just gallops through the uh, finish line. You didn't know what I was going to do, see? And so predictions is nonsense, okay? It's only religious people who do foretelling and palm reading. You know, we don't, we don't do that in science. Okay, experiment. We don't need experiments in science because you can do an experiment. What does that mean? That, you know, uh, that you understood? Just because you did an experiment you go to the lab your teacher tells you you know your chemistry teacher says mix the blue uh, liquid with a red liquid okay and it goes kapow never do that again <laughs> and did you understand why that happened or you say well i did the experiment so i'm a scientist no just doing experiments doesn't do anything you have to understand what you did what the cause what the mechanism was then you then you're a scientist then you use your brain but to say it happened. I put the uh, red liquid with a blue liquid, and suddenly it turned in green or it blew up. Well, all you did, ha all you have, is a description. Is that what you're going to put on your report? It happened. You know, is that is that science? Uh, describe mathematically. They call it a theory. No, a description is not a theory. A theory is an explanation. But that's what they do. They describe mathematically and call those theories. Then they invent technology. What to confirm the theory? Is that what uh, any, uh, technology is for? Say, ah, we have a quantum computer. That proves that quantum is correct. <laughs> and then they say, well, we don't know how quantum works. Entanglement, we have no idea. Superposition, we have no idea how that works. It's just mystical to us. So they don't understand it, but they proved it. Well, how? They proved it by making a computer, and they say it's a quantum computer. They put the adjective quantum in front of it. They qual that qualifier. And now they have the quantum computer, and that means it proves quantum. That's the way they look at it, okay? No, it doesn't prove because uh, technology does not prove a theory, an explanation. You know, um, quantum computers do not prove that a particle can be at two places at once, which is what quantum theorizes. And GPS does not prove that time is a physical object that you can dilate, that you can stretch or shrink or whatever. Okay, so uh, GPS does not prove anything, and quantum computers doesn't prove anything. Gadgets do not prove anything. Okay, the question is, does time dilate? Can you stretch time? The answer is absolutely no. Okay, and because it's a concept, we don't stretch concepts in uh, in physics. Okay, uh, then what you do is convince other mathematicians. Okay, um, for that you have to present proof, evidence, you know, facts, and they accept those. They say, okay, you've proven it. We're convinced. Again, uh, that's religion. We're not talking about something objective. We're talking about something subjective where you convince someone to believe like you do. That's all they did here. And then uh, someone else says, I'm going to verify your measurements. Okay, so he measured the table and said, yep, you're right. It was one meter and one centimeter long. So uh, you verified his measurement. That's science because you verified the other guy's measurement. Got the same equation. Again, nonsense. Then you obviously, if uh, you did it right and all your peers love you, then they'll give you a prize and you know, maybe a gold medal of some kind, and then you walk the circuit, the celebrity circuit. Okay? That's, uh, in a nutshell, what the mathematical method is. That is what they say is the scientific method in a nutshell. Okay, what are the results of this so-called scientific method today? What kind of results do we have today? Okay, uh, Using this so-called scientific method that they inherited from 17th centuries like uh, Galileo and uh, Newton, well, here it is, okay? Uh, these are just some examples off the top of my head. Big Bang, creationism. They say that the matter came in 
from nowhere. Suddenly, matter self-created. In other words, uh, it's uh, creationism without God. In uh, traditional religions, you have uh, God creating the first bit of matter. Okay, We don't know where God came from, what they say, that he's eternal. He was never born. He never died. He never had a mother. He doesn't have a belly button. Okay, fine. Uh, that's easier to believe that, uh, than um, to say that uh, matter just came in from the void when uh, Black, the Big Bang also created the void, created space, created nothing, the vacuum. And so you have the creation of nothing and the creation of something. What was there before something and nothing? That's the question. <laughs> I mean, nothing is as nothing as it gets. And uh, they say, well, before nothing, there was nothing. <laughs> before space, there was space. And then within that, we created something. We don't know how it self-created itself. We don't care. Uh, but it, it did happen. And uh, so here's the movie of uh, Big Bang. Okay, They always go to frame number two. They never go to frame number one. Okay, they say, look, the theory says that if you take all the galaxies which are flying apart from each other today, if you get them closer and closer together like they were in the past, at some point you're going to reach some singularity, which is frame number two there, and we call that singularity the Big Bang. That's what it exploded. And you say, well, hold it, how did that singularity get there? Okay, and remember that space was also created. Space is inside the little uh, dot there, the frame number two dot, and the black stuff, I had to put something around it just to give it some contour, okay? But really that uh, black stuff around the little dot should not be there because that's not space. Space is inside the dot. So we have matter and space, that's the singularity. Zero dimensional singularity somehow contains matter and space. That's frame number two. There's nothing outside of it, so, so we cannot contrast it. There's no contour to that little point. I had to put it in there by hand because I had to show you something. But then the question is, you say, what happened in frame number one? How did that little dot appear to begin with? And that singularity. And they say, well, you know, the theory, we don't know what happened before frame number two. We start always at frame number two. Well, that's cheating. See, that's cheating for several reasons. First, because a singularity is not an object. It's a concept. It's a concept that says if you take something infinite and make it infinitesimally small, you never approach zero. It just approaches root zero. It, it never is zero. It just approaches zero. And then you say, well, what's outside of that little dot? What is that little dot pushing up against? And they say, well, there's nothing outside of it. Yeah, no kidding. I thought nothing was also inside of it. What is that black stuff against, you know, that against which uh, this space time, this Big Bang is expanding uh, against? In other words, what is, what is uh, it pushing against? We need to identify that black stuff in order to give contour to our little old dot. And of course they say, well, we don't know what happened before. Well, they don't even know what happened in frame number two because frame number two is already irrational. It's irrational because space, time, and matter is inside that little dot and that black stuff should not even be there to give it contour. And if there's no contour, what the hell is that singularity? Okay, this is the issue. Okay, so uh, those are the problems with the Big Bang. But getting back here, we have the black hole. It's, zero, it's a zero-dimensional object. Now, how irrational is that? What do you mean uh, black hole is zero-dimensional? No size, no dimensions, no, no length, width, or height, nothing. I mean, that is the definition of nothing. And some people say, well, Bill, you got it wrong. Uh, black hole is not zero-dimensional. Well, so for these people, we again have to educate them. They are ignorant people who do not understand what a black hole is. So let's educate these ignorant people. Okay, here's the black hole according to Mr. Stephen Hawking. And he says, Chandra Sekhar calculated that a cold star of more than about one and a half times the mass of the sun would not be able to support itself against its own gravity. Would it collapse to infinite density? What is infinite density? No volume. That's what it is. Eddington was shocked by that implication, and he refused to believe Chandrasekhar's result. Eddington thought it was simply not possible that a star could collapse to, what? A point. Einstein himself wrote a paper in which he claimed that stars would not shrink to, what? Zero size. Zero size. A black hole is zero size. A singularity is zero size. No volume, no dimensions, no nothing. And it says, well, Chandrasekhar won the Nobel Prize for proving that a black hole collapse, or in other words, a star, collapses to zero size if it's big enough. And then uh, another fellow, he's from uh, Cambridge, uh, big shot uh, astrophysicist there, says, on solving an equation with a particular value rho of central density, you will get a model of a star with mass m and radius r. Plot r as a function of m and show that r falls to zero 
when m is equal to the Chandrasekhar mass. If you can do all these, then you have repeated the calculation for which Chandrasekhar won the Nobel Prize. So anyone who says anything other than a black hole is zero size is an ignoramus. Okay, he doesn't know what he's talking about. Okay, and here, just in case, uh, let's rub it in. Uh, we have a circular uh, circularity in the argument. Okay, it's a circular argument. The circular argument is that a black hole, um, in other words, a star, crushes all matter out of existence by the time it uh, becomes a black hole. There is no matter. And if there is no matter, what you have a black hole is what? It's all mass and no matter. But mass is the quantity of matter or a measure of the quantity of matter. And uh, if a black hole crushes all matter out of existence, then you have no mass. So not only do you have uh, no mass, you have absolutely nothing because you have a black hole is whatever something, for lack of a better word, it's really a nothing that has no size and no mass whatsoever because it has no matter. So what is a black hole? Well, a black hole, again, is nothing. That's what a black hole, what they've defined is nothing. It has no mass, no size, no matter, no nothing. It's just vacuum. Okay, so that's what the definition of black hole is. And there you see on the left, uh, what is mass? Well, they don't even know what, a ma what mass is. They define it as the quantity of matter on the one hand, and they tell you there's seven different kinds of, or different definitions of the word mass. Okay, and yeah, again, if the black hole crushes all matter out of existence, then you have no mass, and that's what a black hole is. A nothing that has no size, no matter, no mass. Okay, they also have dark matter and dark energy. One, uh, these are Dark matter is an ad hoc variable that apparently produces some kind of gravity. And dark energy is the opposite. It's anti-gravity. It pushes everything outwards out there in the universe. That's what is causing the expansion of the universe, according to all these individuals. But the funny part is over there on the upper right says that a uh, big percentage, like over 70% is dark energy. Uh, what is it? 23% is dark matter. And that's, they say, a measure of their ignorance. There you have, what, 96%. That's a measure of their ignorance of what they don't know, what they can't see. They can't see or touch dark matter or dark energy. Okay, so again, for those who talk about see touch, you know, the ob object being see touch, well, apply it here. What is dark matter if you can't see or touch it? What is dark energy if you can't see or touch it? What is a black hole if you can't see or touch it? Okay. And uh, yeah, then you have particles at two places at once. Okay, you cannot even imagine that. Okay, so these are irrational explanations that the establishment has. What's a wave packet? Can anyone draw it? No, it's unimaginable. So you can't draw it. You can't illustrate a wave packet. Penrose there uh, drew a corkscrew with an arrow going right through its center. A ridiculous nonsense that he put in a book. Okay, so uh, uh, Roger Penrose, Nobel Prize, by the way. Okay, and this is the nonsense they published. Big uh, men with big degrees, with big uh, uh, names. And this is what they draw, kindergarten stuff that no one can even imagine. That's the wave packet there. An excited field, you know, here, here you have an excited field. Okay, what is a field? Well, a field is a bunch of numbers. That's what it is. Okay, in the religion of mathematical physics, a field is a physical quantity, okay, that has a value for each point in space-time. What are we talking about? We're talking about numbers, a quantity that has different values for different locations in space-time. Okay, that's what they're saying. That's what a field is. Field is a bunch of vibrating numbers. Uh, I mean, it's, if it's an excited field, right? A field is a set, a fundamental algebraic structure. No, no such thing as an algebraic structure. That's not a structure. It's called. A, it's known as a concept. Okay, mathematicians uh, have the bad habit of calling structure so that which ain't. Okay, and then we have the atom. You can't illustrate it. And there you have uh, the uh, atom that they use for ionization, for electricity, for quantum jump. And that atom there, you know, the question is, why doesn't the electron fly away? What keeps it there? And they put that circle in there and they say, well, it's an energy uh, level. It's an orbital. What is that? That's a concept. That's a region. You have to tell me why, what, what is it? Is it a, uh, a shell of some kind, a solid shell that prevents the electron from flying away? Okay, why doesn't it fall towards the nucleus, which was the reason they initially investigated the atom. They, they wanted to know why the electron didn't fall into the nucleus. They still don't have an answer to that question. And then you have warp time. They say that's gravity. So you have all this, these minutes and seconds that uh, the Earth rolls around. It can't, it can't fly out of the solar system because of all these curved minutes and seconds prevent it from doing so. So these are the irrational explanations that you see out there today. These, this is what you'll find out there. And to say that this has something to do with science, well, no, it's nonsense. Absolute poppycock. That's what it is. We got to call it what it is. I'm not exaggerating here. In fact, I'm, if anything, I'm being kind. Okay, this is worthless garbage. Okay, 
And what a lot of mathematicians do, they dismiss all those as saying, well, we don't know how this universe works, uh, invisible and tangible stuff. They can't deal with that. And so they say, what we do is equations. That's, that's our job. That's what physics is, equations. I thought that was math. It's when they try to give a physical interpretation to the equation. That's when they cross the line into physics, and that's where you get only irrational explanations like the ones you just heard. Okay. So this is the issue. Okay, here we have uh, one fellow I mentioned in the past. I'll mention him again. His name is Donald Simonek, and he says, science doesn't explain. Science describes. Well, he's at least got that part right. Yeah, science uh, from a mathematical point of view. They say science doesn't explain. Science describes. So that when you ask for an explanation, they cannot give it to you, a mechanism. If he understood that, then he's got it right. They cannot give you an explanation. That's why they say mathematical physics doesn't explain. It just describes, meaning equations. Why? Because that's all that equations can do. Okay. So science, uh, some people define it testable explanations. No such monster. Okay. No such monster uh, according to the official version. The official version is science describes. Why? Because math can only describe. Okay. And they say math is the language of science only because math describes and they equated science, not with explanations, but with descriptions. That's all they can do. And so uh, if math can only describe, then science cannot be testable explanations, as some mathematicians argue out there. Okay, so this is where the problems are. Okay, what is the rational scientific method in comparison? Here you have it. We say it's rational explanations. If it's irrational, we don't, it's not part of science, period. And what are uh, irrational explanations? The movement of concepts. You cannot use the word energy. You cannot use the word mass. You cannot use the word field, force, wave, ether, um, uh, what is it, plasma, electricity. You can't use any of those concepts. Those are all concepts. Not one is a physical object. And the problem is that a lot of people there out there, they confuse it or they, they were led to believe that those are physical objects. Electric universers, flat universe, uh, uh, and the flat uh, earthers. All of them believe in the same thing. They believe that um, these words represent objects. So they say a field. Field does this, a field does that. It moved the charge. No, you have concept hitting against concepts here. Field is a concept, charge is a concept, wave is a concept. You cannot do physics with, by moving concepts around. That's irrational. Rational explanations, you have to have physical objects. One surface of one object coming in contact with the surface of another object, we can all understand that. That's rational. You can make a movie of it. You can illustrate it. But when you say energy hit uh, mass, then we have a problem, okay? Or convert it into mass or the field vibrated. What are you going to illustrate? What are you going to illustrate for a mathematical concept? So, there, so that's the reason there are no illustrations, okay? And we're going to get that in a minute with our science critic. Anyways, uh, there you have it. Uh, step one, hypothesis. Hypothesis is a synonym of the word assumption. That's what a hypothesis is. And it includes the objects you're going to identify that are going to form the basis of your theory. That's what you're going to move around. The definitions. You better have solid definitions. You better be able to defend each one of them. It's very critical to have the right definitions. And, uh, and then uh, part of that, part of the assumptions are the initial scene. Okay? Could be a series of uh, illustrations, the first few frames in your movie. Okay, and you say, this is what happened, according to me. Not according to Mother Nature, not according to Father Universe, God, or the devil, according to me. So it's a statement of the facts. It's not the facts. The facts is what they know, what God knows, what Mother Nature knows. They know exactly what happened. They have that in their filing cabinet. We have no access to the filing cabinet. End of story. We don't know the facts, especially of something that happened. All we can tell you is what we think happened, and that's a statement of the facts not the facts, okay? It's your personal statement of the facts. But that's what you're going to base your theory on. So you're going to put the objects, the definition, the statement of the facts. Now you build your theory, your explanation, your mechanism, the causes on that foundation. Okay, that's what we're talking about. And what are you going to explain? You're going to explain the mechanism, you're going to explain the causes, and read some kind of conclusion. That's our scientific method. That's what we propose. Okay? Okay, so... Um, you can't have, um, you, you can't use um, see and touch. You can't use experiments. That's why we don't have it in there, okay? Experiments are irrelevant. Why? Because there's no way you can use experiments, see and touch, to uh, detect those uh, mediators which are invisible and intangible. There are invisible and tangible mediators. A mediator, an object, a thing, is not that which you can see or touch. We do not use the senses, okay? It's that which has shape. 
and an object has shape before you use any senses upon it. Before you see, before you touch, that thing that you're going to see or touch had better already have shape before you do anything. The moon had shape before anyone on earth was born. So we did not convert the moon into an object by seeing it or touching it, landing on it, you know, or seeing an asteroid hit it. Hopefully uh, the blind man also considers the moon an object even though he can't see it or touch it, right? So, yeah, the moon is an object because it has shape, not because the blind man uh, finally was able to see one day and see the moon, the shape of the moon. Okay, and so, yeah, the mediator of light, have we ever seen that? A photon, a wave, have we seen any of those? Uh, gravity, what is the mediator of gravity? Pencil, right? Experiment, can you see or touch anything here? No, nope. there it goes, always falls to the floor, never to the ceiling, never to the left or the right, okay? Magnetism, we have two magnets, right? And there you go, little magnets. Already, you can see how it pulls on it. <laughs> it's already pulling on one magnet on another. Is there anything that you can see there in between? And yeah, it's not coming from the outside because you can feel it pulling from the insides. It's already dragging my fingers inwards. Okay, so you can do this at home, always in the presence of a relativist, okay? And uh, yeah, a magnet attracts another because there is a physical object in between them that's doing that, that job. You got to identify the physical object, the invisible intangible object that's in there, and there's no experiment that you can run. Here's the experiment. That's the only experiment you ever need. Okay, now you know what magnetism is. Now you don't need any other experiment ever. Now you need to explain how that happened. Okay, if you can't explain how that happened, what caused it to happen, uh, then you're not a scientist. If you say that it happened and there's nothing between those two magnets, then you're doing black magic. If you say it was a field, magnetic field, then you're doing irrationality. Again, you're using a concept. You're saying that a bunch of numbers, which is what a field is, you know, a set of numbers, that's what caused one magnet to be attracted to another. No, the field only tells you the strength, how strong that pull is. It doesn't explain the cause, the mechanism. That's why Mr. Richard uh, Feynman, Nobel Prize, he could explain how a magnet works. And you can look him up in YouTube and you'll find out he wasn't able to explain how a magnet attracts another. He says, it just does. Same answer that all flat earthers, flat universers, and electric universers give you.